scripture lesson today is from 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, you can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easy angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But where there are, no, are prophecies, there will, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For, you, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as, it, as a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. How I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. Amen to that. So in our scripture reading for today, we find Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and he's writing this letter because things are not going well in the church at Corinth. There's lots of quarreling and people moving away from the teachings that he had given to them when he established the church. And so he writes this letter to them because of that. Now this particular passage, I think that we could probably make an argument that this is probably the second most well-known scripture in the Bible. I would think people probably only know John 3.16 more than this particular piece of scripture. And if you've been to a wedding or an anniversary celebration, most likely you've heard this passage read aloud. I did two weddings this past summer, and this was a part of each one of those weddings. And if I'm being honest, it was a part of my own wedding as well. You see, it's verses 4 to 6 that gets the most time devoted to it because it speaks so eloquently about what love is and what love does. Now, don't misunderstand me when I say that this is used all the time. I'm not being glib about it, and I'm not saying that this scripture is overused. I honestly don't think people can hear this scripture enough, that we can't be reminded of what love is enough in this world, especially today. You see, the idea of love, along with so many other things in this world, is something that has truly become over-sexualized. It's as if the world has forgot that there is a difference between love and lust. Love is pure. And lust, it just isn't. However, the world has decided that these two thoughts and these ideas are interchangeable things. When we look at how love is described in the Bible, it's clear that that is not the case. Starting in verse 4 again, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That is what love is and what love does. Now, lust is none of those things. It is not patient. It is not kind. It is full of envy. 
It is often boastful and full of pride. It dishonors the person who's lusting and the one they're lusting after. And it is definitely self-seeking. When lust is rejected, anger is almost always what comes out of it. There is no protection and no trust in it. And when it is spurned, it does not persevere for long. So I want to make sure that we are clear on this understanding. What the world views as love and what we and what God views as love, they are not the same thing. Indeed, they are truly polar opposites. When I read this scripture, I'm struck most immediately at the beginning. You see, we are told about all these wonderful things that we can accomplish and the feats that we can achieve. We can speak to angels. We can fathom all the mysteries of knowledge. We can have a faith that moves mountains. We can give all that we have, every possession we own, and give ourselves over as our physical being to others and overcome any hardships that come our way. But if we do not have love while we are doing any of those things, if we do not approach others from the standpoint of loving them while serving them, then none of those wonderful things matter. Think of it this way. You win the lottery. You have more money than you could ever possibly know what to do with. But because you just don't have any love in your life, you find out that the world has decided to do away with money, and that ticket that you had is now completely worthless. You see, we are told that we can have anything and we can do we could be whatever we want, and we can do anything in this world. But if there is no love in who we are and what we're doing, then we have no meaning. As I was thinking about the sermon this week and studying the scripture, I took time to consider what love means to me. And I kept coming back to this idea and focusing on this idea that love, unconditional love, true love, is a love that sacrifices. Well, you might be thinking to yourself, no, love is full of butterflies and rainbows. It's that wonderful feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when you see that person that you just can't live without in the world. And well, yes, sometimes that is what love is. I think what Paul was getting at when he talks about us being a child is that type of love. You see, when we're children, we have this idea of what we think love is and what it means to love someone, and it's often put into that perspective. But as we grow and as we mature, we find out that love is much deeper than those feelings. And our idea of what love is changes. So we put away our childish view of what love is, and we learn about what it means to truly love. So as I've grown over, older, I've found that love is marked by sacrifice, the sacrifices that we make for one another, the sacrifices that we make willingly and without holding a grudge. See, there is no love found in a sacrifice for someone when you do this and then immediately demand repayment for that love you gave them. There's no love found when you do something great for somebody else, but complain about having to do the task the entire time. Love is found in selfless sacrifice. And the greatest love this world has ever known is due to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The way he was willing to die for us so that we could be free of sin and have life eternal with him, that is the greatest act of love that this world has ever known. You know, as I thought about love being full of sacrifice this week, I considered what this week marked for us. Now, I know that it's not lost on you, those that are old enough to know, that yesterday was September 11th, and this year marking the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks. And like any other major historical event, when we remember those days, we tend to go back and remember where we were, how we were feeling at the day and time that it happened. Now, in the past, that when I thought about this, I remember it very clearly. I'm sure you do as well. I was a senior in high school that year. We were getting ready to have our first home soccer game for the season. I even know the team that we were supposed to play that night. 
I remember how we watched the news coverage in school all day long in all my classes except for one. That one teacher saying, no, we're gonna to continue today as if it was any other day. I remember at the time thinking, this is ridiculous. This is a major historical event. We should be kicking in everything we can about it. But I realized as I'm growing older, she was just trying to give us a sense of normalcy for that day. See, she knew that the world was gonna change that day. And she wanted to give us just maybe one more hour of remembering what it was like before. Now I know all of you that are old enough, you have stories like this that are similar. But as I've grown older, I've also started to remember other things about that day and the days that followed as well. See, I remember the pictures of the first responders and the ordinary people running towards the towers as they fell. I remember how those brave people sacrificed themselves in acts of love to try and help others. Because that is what they were doing that day. Loving others in ways that showed the true meaning of the word. We're told in John 15, chapter 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And as I've grown older, I also remember the way that people of this country came together with one another at this time. The way that petty differences were put aside and we simply tried our best to love one another and to help each other through a difficult time. Now, as I think about things the way they are today, I must ask this question. Where has the love gone? Why are we willing, uh, allowing ourselves to be turned away from loving one another in ways that God has called us to love each other? Has the meaning of love changed? Has what God has called us as a people to be changed? Has the love that Jesus Christ showed for us on the cross changed? The answer is no. None of those things have changed. What has changed is us. We have allowed ourselves as a people to change who we will love and how we will love them. Now I want you to think back to math class for a second. And I can assure you that this was very difficult for me because I did not pay very much attention to math class as a child. But I do remember that we were taught if-then statements. And they go something like this. If x is greater than 3 and less than 5, then x is equal to 4. You see, that is what we have allowed love to become in this world. It has become an if-then statement for us. If you do this, then I will love you. If you are this, then I will love you. If you vote this way, then I will love you. If you don't look or act or achieve what I think is right, then I will not love you. Brothers and sisters, that is not love. That is not the love of Jesus Christ, what he has called to us to share with one another. The love that God has called us to give is love that is given freely and unconditionally. There are no strings attached to that love. There are no qualifications to earn that love. Again, John chapter 15, this time verse 12. That is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, we are loved by Jesus Christ. He loves us warts and all. So if we are to love others the way that he has loved us, then we better start doing it. And we better start loving them warts and all. And you might be thinking to yourself this morning, well, pastor, that's a great idea in theory, but impossible to do in practice. You don't know the people that I know. You can't possibly understand. You see, that person over there is a sinner. That person over there is a Democrat. That person over there is a Republican. That person is this or that person is that. Well, guess what? We are all sinners that fall short of the glory of God. And he loves us anyways. 
So we must be willing to love each other in that same way. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to like what other people do. I'm not telling you that you have to approve of what they say or what they think. Indeed, if we think about how God views us, then I know there are times when he doesn't like what I do or he doesn't necessarily like what I say. But he loves me just the same. Now, in our scripture, it closes with these three remain faith, hope and love. And the greatest is love. Now, if you've been here over the last three weeks, or if you've been tuning in online over the last three weeks, you may have put this together for yourselves. Two weeks ago, we talked about faith. Last week, we talked about hope. And this week, we talk about love. Faith and hope are two very powerful things. Faith is the ability to believe even when you don't see. Hope is the ability to hold on to something and that belief. But love is even greater. You see, if faith is the ability to have the, to believe, and hope is the ability to hold on to that belief, well, love is belief in action. I'm going to say that again. Love is belief in action. So if you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, if you have hope that one day you're going to walk with them in eternity, then you must put that love into action in this world. One simple challenge for you this week. How can you show just one person, just one person, the love of Jesus Christ this week?